If you look at Ephesians chapter 2, you have the stuff that is laid out. I used the term last week for you, the sine qua non, the Latin word. The sine qua non of the dispensation of grace is equality between Jews and Gentiles. Without Jew and Gentile equality, God cannot reconcile both into one God, both to Himself in one body by the cross. And so we've discussed in detail the fall of Israel, the diminishing of Israel, how when God looks at the world today, He sees mankind without distinction. And the former division that existed in time past where Israel enjoyed an advantage and a, and, and, and a situation that was uh, favorable to them in their relationship with God, how that has changed. If you look at Ephesians 2, verse 11, Paul says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, <clears throat> and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 11 and 12 there again, they describe the condition of, in a time period that Paul identifies as time past. And if you look over here at the chart on the wall, we've been over this information and we know, we know or should know at this point that time past is characterized by God dealing with the world on the basis of this distinction where the Jews enjoy all the spiritual advantages and the Gentiles are without hope and without God, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. And then you get to verse 13 and he says, But now in Christ Jesus ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You get to verse 13 and Paul identifies a great change that's occurred. There's been a change in the way God deals with man. And what was true back there in time past, what was true in the way God dealt with humanity back there, you come to verse 13 and Paul identifies that there's been a change. And the change that he identifies is, is brought about on the basis of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and His cross work and what He accomplishes at the cross. Verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh. How? Folks, where did Christ shed His blood? He shed His blood on the cross. Was the cross prophesied? Was there stuff in the Old Testament that Christ would die, that the Son of God would die to pay for sin, the sin of the nation of Israel? The answer is what? Yes, that's in the Old Testament. What's not in the Old Testament, though, is that God, on the basis of the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that He would reconcile to Himself in one body both Jew and Gentile. Drop down, if you would, to verse um, 16. And he says, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body. How? By the cross. Having slain the enmity thereby. Folks, was something accomplished at the cross that they did not know about in time past? The cross provides for the accomplishment of something that was a mystery, that was a secret, that was unknown, that, unknown, that was unrevealed where? In time past. Come with me, if you would, to first Corinthians, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, I want you to keep these verses in your mind from Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 is telling us here that the church, the body of Christ, is formed on the basis of some things that are accomplished by the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? The but now time period is related to something about the cross. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 again, verse 6. <laughs> Actually, look at verse 7. Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, But we speak the wisdom of God how? How? What's a mystery again? Mystery is a secret, right? He says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden what? Wisdom. Which God ordained when? When did He ordain this? Before the world, before the foundation of the world, did God have in His mind that He was going to do this? Okay? Now watch. He says in verse 7, <clears throat> But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto whose glory? Unto our glory, the church's glory, the Corinthians' glory. Now watch. With none, which none of the princes of this world knew. So did the princes of this world know about this wisdom of God and a mystery? No, Paul says they did not. He says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it. So if they would have known what this was, Paul says, they would not have crucified who? 
the Lord of glory. So I have a question for you. How is the church and body of Christ formed according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 and 16? That he might reconcile both unto himself in one body, how? By the cross, right? But now you who you sometimes were far off are made nigh, verse 13, by the blood of who? By the blood of Christ. Paul is saying, in, Paul is saying here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that there is something about the cross. There's something about the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ that was a mystery, that was kept secret, that was hidden, that God had it in His mind to do before the world what? Began. And if the princes of this world had known what this information was, they would not have done what? Crucified the Lord of glory. So there's something in this mystery, there's something in this information that God is, is making known and revealing through, to and through the Apostle Paul that stretches all the way back before the foundation of the world, that if anybody knew about this information, Satan and his buddies never would have done what? Crucified the Lord of glory. Now, come with me if you would to Ephesians chapter 1. You know what? Skip that. Go to chapter 3. We'll come back to that later. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3. Now, we, this, we, we were ending here last Sunday. The but now time period. Paul gives it a name in chapter 3 and he calls it the dispensation of grace. Chapter 3, verse 1, for, I, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, watch, which is given me to you word. Who received the dispensation of grace? Paul did. Paul received it and his job now is to do what? Give it out. Give it to others. Right? How that by revelation. Now, how else? The on, folks, the only way you're going to know the wisdom of God and the mystery, the wisdom that He had in His mind to do before the foundation of the world, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the only way you're going to know that is if He reveals it. Right? And that's what verse 3 says. How that by revelation He made known unto who? Unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge, knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Now is that similar to what he says in 1 Corinthians 2? In 1 Corinthians 2 he says that if the princes of this world had known about this wisdom of God and mystery, they never would have what? They never would have crucified the Lord of glory. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So now verse Verse 5 again, Ephesians 3, 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now, what? Revealed. So in time past, did they know this information? No. In the but now, has it been revealed? And it's related to what he calls the dispensation of grace in verse 2. Verse 5, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers together of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Again, I'm not saying this to be mean, ugly, nasty, or unkind. But if you are using a modern version there, your version says that we are made heirs together with Israel. And the reason it says that is because it is coming from a different set of manuscripts. What Paul is saying here in these verses is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same what? Body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the Gospel. Okay? So the, the, the body of Christ now is going to be formed by both Jew and Gentile believing what? The Gospel. Right? Then he says in verse 7, he says in verse 7, Wherefore I was made a minister, according to the gifts of the grace of God given unto me, <coughs> by the effectual working of His power, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among who? The Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Folks, why are they unsearchable? They're unsearchable because they were what? They were a mystery. They were hidden. Nobody knew about them. People in ages and generations prior, they didn't know about them. If the princes of this world had known about it, they wouldn't have crucified who? The Lord of glory. Verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, 
Now watch. Which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in who? Hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. This information was hid where? Was it hid in the Old Testament Scripture? No, it was hid where? It was hid in God, and the only reason anybody knows anything about it is but for the Godhead choosing to reveal it. Okay? That's the only way you're going to know this. And the Godhead chooses to reveal it to Paul, and it's Paul's job, it is Paul's charge, to take that which was revealed to him and deliver it to who? To us, to everyone else, right? Watch verse 10. To the intent. Now see that? Now see what you're going to get into now in verse 10 is the intent. What was God after in this? Why did he do it this way? To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the what? The manifold wisdom of who? Is the manifold wisdom of God now on full display? What Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden one. Wisdom. Which none of the princes of this world know, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Here in verse 10 he says, to the intent that now one of the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. See, what's interesting here is he's now going to shift your attention and he's going to focus your attention where? In the heavenly places. God reveals the mystery to and through the Apostle Paul because by doing so, he seeks to accomplish something for himself where? In the heavens. And who's involved in that? The church. Are you, are you the church? If you're a member of the body, if you're saved, are you the church? If you're the church, are you involved in what verse 10 is talking about? Are you involved in making known in the, in the principalities and powers and heavenly places the manifold wisdom of God? See, the reason they're interested in that is because there's this whole bunch of information that they didn't want. No, and had they known about this information, would they have chosen to act differently? Yes. Now come with me to, hold your hand there and come over to Ezekiel. Now this is where we ended last Sunday. Come over to Ezekiel chapter 28. Somebody says to me, I've got this question all, all kinds of different times. Well, why would God do it like that? Isn't that just so long? And it, why did he take so long? And why isn't he doing it this way or that way? Wouldn't it have made more sense if God decided to operate or function in this way over here? Folks, can I tell you that the main theme of your Bible is not your and my individual salvation? Ooh. Is our salvation part of the Bible? Yes. But the main theme of the Bible is what God is doing in a universe that He created for who? Himself. See, we tend to get all inflated in our opinion of ourselves, and we think this morning is that you are part of something as a member of the body of Christ that God is seeking to accomplish for who? For Himself. He has saw fit to involve you and I in His plan. Okay? Now you talk about grace. I don't remember ever signing up when somebody first shared the gospel of Christ with me and I came to a place where I understood that I was a sinner, that I could not save myself, and that I needed to reach out in faith to a Redeemer who paid the price for me and took care of my sin and rose again the third day. I don't remember ever signing saying anything saying, you want to be a part of my plan? But guess what? You did. Because through that process of redemption and justification, God made you a member of His body, correct? And it is God's express will, purpose, and desire to take that body that He's using and use it to accomplish something for who? Himself. Look at Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Now, have we looked at verses so far this morning about the mystery? being hidden, and so forth. And if the information had been known, people would have chosen to act. People, individuals, beings would have chosen to act differently, right? Ezekiel 28, the, the, the passage here is, is in reference to the, 
the king or the prince of Tyre and, and what's going on here. Look at verse uh, 2. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thy heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thy heart as the heart of God. Folks, this passage is talking about the individual that is behind the actions here of the Prince of Tyre. Okay? Now look at what it says in verse 3. It says, Behold, thou art wiser than who? Daniel. There's no what? There's no what? Okay. What's a secret? Is a secret a mystery? Just so you understand the context, I'm getting ahead of myself, but drop down to verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the burl, the onyx, and so on and so forth. Look at the end of verse 13. Uh, thy tabrets and thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. i got a question. That verse says that this individual, the prince of, uh, of Tyre, of Tyre, the king of Tyrus, was in the Garden of Eden. Is that what it says? Well, who do you know is in the Garden of Eden? Adam, Eve, God, and Satan. When he's talking here to the prince of Tyrus, he is talking beyond the human king to the real individual that is behind who? That king. And he, and, he, and he says that he was in the Garden of Eden, and that he, he sealed up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect and beauty and so on. Then it says in verse 14, Thou art the anointed what? Cherub. So is it obvious here that the, from the language that he is speaking to an individual that is behind the, the, king, the human king of Tyrus? And that individual claims back in verse 3 that he's wiser than Daniel and that there's no what? Do you understand? Okay, what is he claiming? Is he claiming to be more powerful than God? Is that what his claim is? Is it clear from the rest of the passage here that he understands that he's created? Look, folks, who's got more power, the creator or the created? There's really no dispute about that, is there? Okay, if I have the capacity to bring you into existence then it's pretty clear that I'm more powerful than you. Right? So the issue between God and Satan never was an issue of who was more powerful. The issue between God and Satan was an issue not of power, but of what? Wisdom. Lucifer goes to God and he goes, I am wiser than you are. There's no, you, you can't keep, there's nothing you can do, there's no secret that you can keep that I can't what? Find out. So what does God do? God says, okay, I'd like to take you up on that. Let's see about that. So what does God do? Come back with me to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians two. First Corinthians chapter two. Verse seven. But we speak the wisdom of God in a in a what? Now think about this. What did Lucifer say? He says, I there's no secret you can what? Keep from me. And so how does God respond? Okay, buddy, you, you're so smart, you can figure everything out. You know better than I. I'll take you up on that offer, and all I'm going to do is keep a what? A secret. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world in our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have what? So if Satan and his minions had known about this secret that God kept, would they have ever crucified the Lord Jesus Christ? No. Well, why did God do it this way? 
This verse, 1 Corinthians 3.19, I don't think that's the verse I want. Oh, yeah, it is. Go to 1 Corinthians 3.19. It says here, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. He says, go, flip back to chapter 1 quick. Talking about the wisdom of the world. In verse 19, he says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now watch, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. So God in His wisdom set it up so that man in His wisdom would never know who. Would never know God. For after that in the wisdom of God, sorry, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not who? God. It pleased God by the foolishness of what? Preaching to save them that what? Believe. Drop down to verse... 27, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world uh, which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and these things which are not to bring to naught them which are, that no flesh should glory in His what? In His presence. Go back to chapter 3, verse 19. He says in verse 19 here, He says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with who? With God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own what? Folks, what did, he, what did that guy say in Ezekiel 28, verse 3? He says, I am wiser than Daniel, there's no what? Secret that can be hid from thee. So what does God do? He keeps a secret. All he does is keep a secret about what he intends. And guess what? When, when the secret is made known, it reveals things that if the guy would have known them before, he never would have what? Crucified the Lord of glory. He takes the wise in their own craftiness. Now, come with me back to Genesis chapter 14. <clears throat> and on your way there, I want you to get Genesis 1-1 in your mind. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. According to Genesis 1, 1, what two things did God create? The heaven and the earth. Genesis chapter 14, look with me at verse, 19, uh, verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and was the priest of who? The Most High God. And he blessed him and said unto him, Blessed be Abram, uh, the, Abram of the Most High God, possessor of what? Folks, according to your Bible, what does the term most high mean? The most high means to be the one that possesses what? Heaven and earth. Read on. Look at the next verse. Verse 21, And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said, and Abram said unto the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of what? Heaven and earth. Come with me if you would to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. The Most High God, folks, is, the, is a term in your Bible used to describe the possessor. God is the possessor of heaven and earth. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which this week in the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart. Notice that that's past tense. What you're reading about here is the original boast of who? Of Lucifer. He's already said it by the time you get to Isaiah 14. For thou hast said in thine heart, verse 13, I, now watch, there are five I will statements. He says... I will ascend into heaven. Number one. Number two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Number three, I will sit also upon the congregation, mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. 
I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Folks, all four of those first statements tell you that Lucifer was fundamentally ungrateful and unthankful for the position of authority that he'd already been what? That he wants something more. Okay? And then the fifth one is a summation. Verse 14, I will be what? Like who? Folks, when Satan says, I will be like the Most High, what he is after is he's saying, I want to be the one that possesses what? Heaven and earth. Because the, the phrase, the Most High in your Bible, refers to the one that is the possessor of heaven and earth. So what does Satan do? Satan hatches a plan, and he goes out there and he traffics a plan that will bring about him being like who? The Most High. Now, if he's going to be like the Most High, he has to possess the authority of God in what two realms? Heaven and earth. Come back now to Ezekiel 28. <clears throat> Verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. See, Lucifer, he was the sum total of God's creative genius when it came to the issue of wisdom and beauty. Now, if he think about that. If he is the sum total of God's creation, if he sealed up the sum in terms of wisdom and beauty, does it not make sense that if he's going to be lifted up in pride, that he would be lifted up in pride with respect to one of the two areas that he sealed up the sum? And one of them is what? Wisdom. And so when he says in verse 3 that I'm wiser than Daniel, there's no secret that can be what? That is a boast that is made out of the great wisdom that God placed within him. You understand that? And so he looks out at everything that's out there and he goes, you know what I want? I want to be like who? I want to be like the Most High. And to be like the Most High, he has to possess heaven and what? And earth. Skip verse 13 for the sake of time. <coughs> verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast in the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. See, was he up there? So when you read there in Isaiah 14 about I want this and I want that and I want to sit here and I want to sit there and I'm going to go do that, he's saying all that stuff because he knows what that stuff is. And he goes, I know better about how to what? How to run this show. Verse 15, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created till iniquity was what? Found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, I have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Now watch verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted the wisdom by reason of thy what? Brightness. There it is. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings. Verse 18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities and by the iniquity of thy traffic. What's he up there? Is he directing the heavenly traffic? Okay, stop. Come on. Come on through. Is that what he's doing? No. Traffic there means he is going out and he is selling amongst the heavenly hosts this plan about how he's wiser than God, there's no secret that can be hid from him, and how he should really be the one to sit on the throne of the highest accountability. And does he succeed in getting a third of the heavenly host to follow him in his rebellion? See? And as a result, he needs to be what? Kicked out. Does he go after possessing the authority of God in the heavens? Well, 
What about on earth? God makes Adam, puts him in the garden, tells him the earth is yours, have dominion over it, subdue it, and so on and so forth. Chapter 3, who shows up? He shows up, right? And he tempts him to sin. And the authority that God had placed in man in the earth passes to who? Satan. That's why, folks, there's two names for Satan in the scriptures. There's more than two, but there's two that I'm after. He is referred to as the God of this what? World. And, and Paul refers to him in Ephesians chapter 2 as the prince, the power of the air. Why? Did he go out and through his traffic and merchandising hatch a plan to usurp the authority of God in the heavens and the earth? Yes. And he does it under the guise of, I'm wiser than you are, you can't keep any what? Secret from me. Let me see where I'm at here. Come back, come to Matthew chapter 3, quickly. No, Matthew chapter 4. I just want to make this point. Matthew chapter 4. This is in the temptation of Jesus by Satan. And in Matthew's text, this is the third temptation, verse 8. Again the devil taketh him <coughs> up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. What's he showing him there? He's showing him all the glory, all the kingdoms, right? Verse 9. And saith unto him, All these will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, No, you can't. Those aren't your kingdoms. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't say that. Why didn't it say that? Because who possessed the authority of those kingdoms? Satan. Do you understand that if Satan does not possess that authority, that is not a temptation? Right? He's not tempting him to do anything that he can deliver on, therefore it wouldn't really be a temptation if Satan did not actually possess what? The kingdoms. Does Jesus argue with him? Does he dispute the point? Does he say, no, no, those really are your kingdoms, those are my kingdoms? Does he? No. Why does he not do that? Because he knows that the adversary has usurped his authority where? In the earth. And he knows, by the way, why has he come to earth made incarnate in human flesh, by the way? He came unto his own and his own what? Who's his own? He's coming to save Israel from their sins, right? And by the way, what has God promised Israel? We've studied this in great detail. What has God promised Israel? He has promised them a kingdom on the earth. With Christ as the king ruling over all the nations of the earth. Is that prophesied in the Old Testament? Does Satan know that? Is he capable of knowing what God has made known, spoken about, and talked about since the world began? What is he not capable of knowing? He's not capable of knowing the wisdom of God in a mystery because it's been kept what? Secret. So what I'm trying to impress upon you is the following facts. Come with me to Colossians chapter 1 now. Folks, is it a mystery in the least? Is it a secret in the least? that God throughout the Old Testament intended to establish a king and a kingdom vested in the nation of Israel that He would establish on the earth, in Zion, in Jerusalem, with His Son reigning and ruling over the nations. Is that, a, is that even remotely a mystery? Or is that predicted and talked about, explained all through the Old Testament? You don't, you're not answering me, so I hope, that means you, I hope that means you don't know the answer to that by now. The answer is... All that stuff is talked about, predicted, spoken about, made known, and so forth back there in time past through the prophets, is it not? 
But what's not talked about? What's not spoken about? The earth is there. Think about it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, right? In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. What's Genesis 1, 2 say? And the earth was without form in one. Genesis 1, 2 begins to focus your attention not on the heaven, but where? On the earth. And what you have in prophecy is God's prophetic program for how He is going to reestablish and reassert His authority where? In the earth. But what you don't read about in the prophetic scripture is the plan of God to reassert His authority where? In the heavens. Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 5. No, no, verse 16, I'm sorry. I don't know how you go from 5 to 16, but... Verse 16. For by Him were all things created that are... Where? In heaven and where? Are in earth. Visible and invisible. So, let's stop there for a minute. Did God make some things in heaven? Did He make some things on the earth? The things that He made on the earth, are those visible or invisible? Those are visible. The things that He made in the heaven, they're what? They're invisible. But just because they're invisible, does that mean they're not real? No. No. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created. All things. All what things? All thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, visible and invisible in heaven and earth. All that stuff was created by Him and for who? Him. Who's the Him? It's Christ. Okay? So what, what this verse is not talking about the creation of the grass and the trees and the birds and the bees. This is talking about the creation of some governmental what? Structure, some principalities, some powers, some might, some dominions, some in the earth that are visible, some in the heavens that are invisible, but they were all created by Christ and for who? Christ. Verse 17. And he is before all things. Duh. He has to be before all things in order to have created them. He is before all things, and by Him all things what? Consist. And He is, now watch, and He is the head of the body, the church. Is He the head of the body of Christ? Absolutely. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, now watch, that in all things he might have what? Now in the context, what all things is he talking about? What all things is he going to have preeminence in? Heaven and earth, yes, but specifically what in heaven and earth? Thrones, principalities, powers, might, dominion, so on and so forth. So all the structures of governmental authority in heaven and earth that were created by Christ and for Christ, it is, a, it is the express will of God that Christ, as the head of the body, look at verse 18, and He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have what? See, do you see? How is He going to have preeminence in all things? He's going to have preeminence in all things in His function as being the head of the what? The body. Are you a member of that body? Are you a member of that body? If you are a member of that body, does that mean you are a part of what Christ is going to accomplish? <laughs> Verse 18. And He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness what? Now look at verse 20. And having made peace, how? how? Having made peace, how? Through the blood of His what? First verse we read this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Where I speak the wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our what? Glory which none of the princes of this world, what? Knew, for had they known it, they would not have what? So I'll say it again. If this information had been spoken about, talked about, made known, or in any way available, would Satan and his boys have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ? 
No. Look at verse 20. And having made peace, how? So does the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ here accomplish something significant? Yes. And if the information regarding to the mystery had been known, would they have crucified Christ? No. And if they didn't crucify Christ, would there be a part of the eternal plan of God that would have been left undone and would have been left in the hands of the usurper, the adversary? But that's not what happened because God kept a what? He took the wise in His own what? Craftiness. Verse 20, Having made peace through the blood of His cross and by Him to reconcile all things to who? What are the all things? In the context. The all things are the principalities, powers, mights, dominions in heaven and earth, visible in what? Created by Him and what? For Him. And it's on the basis of the blood of His cross that He's going to reconcile all that stuff back to who? But if Satan and his guys had known about the mystery, they wouldn't have what? They would not have, they would not have brought about the act. That is going to lead to, that leads to his complete undoing. Do you see that? Verse 20. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things where? In earth, or things where? See, God is going to reconcile all the structures of governmental authority in heaven and earth. And he's going to center them in what person? The Lord Jesus Christ. Does that happen? And that happens on the basis of the blood of his what? Cross. And if the mystery is revealed, the cross never what? The cross never happens. So what God does is He says, okay, buddy, you're wiser than me. You think you're so full of wisdom that you can figure all this stuff out. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you up on your challenge and I'm just going to keep a what? A secret. That to me is fascinating. Every, every time I teach this, and I've taught it before and I'll probably teach it again, I'm, 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 I stand amazed at what God did. Because God is not... God is not bound to function the way you and I want or wish Him to function. God will choose to function in a way that brings maximum glory and honor to Himself and demonstrates Himself to be the head over all things and the preeminent one in all of the universe in any category that is out there, even if it takes Him 6,000 years plus to do it. Okay? God, God well, I forget how the verse says, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mention it off the top of my head. God is long suffering. I mean, I look, I look at the world today and I say, oh my goodness, how long is God going to allow the dispensation of grace to continue? Because I look at the state of man, the state of the country, the state of the world, and you see everything that's going on, and you say, how much longer can God in His grace forbear with this? But you need to be glad that God is gracious and He is long-suffering because it's on the basis of that grace and long-suffering that He has interrupted the prophetic program, inserted the church, the body of Christ, and saw fit to make you and I a part of His plan, His repossession plan to repossess the heavenly realm back unto who? Himself. And you were part of it and are part of it because you're a member of His what? Of his body. Folks, we're not, we are not waiting for the Lord to return to set up a kingdom on earth. Is Israel waiting for that? We're not waiting for that. We are waiting for the day when the Lord appears in the air to catch us away, to take us to be a part of his governmental plans, not here on earth, but where? In the heavenly places. Go back to Ephesians chapter 1. <coughs> I, 
I, I, I don't, no, how do I want to say this? I can't think of any better message to preach than this message. There's nothing greater in all, in all the world to know that not only did God love you enough to send His Son to die on the cross for your sin, but He, he saw fit to make you part of His body. And then you as a member of that body, He intends to take you and use you for something that He's going to accomplish for His glory. And doesn't, doesn't charge you anything for it. Doesn't require anything of you except to put your faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He's going to give you all of it and He's going to deposit it in, in your lap and say, here, here's my grace. Take it and live your life on the basis of that. Quit fussing and fuming around with worrying about all the stuff and keep your eyes fixed on... Paul says, for our conversation is where? It's in heaven. He talks about for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, work of the far more exceeding and eternal weight of what? Glory. While we wait, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are what? Not seen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse... I want you to understand something here. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling. And what the, now watch, and what the riches of the glory of His what? Inheritance. Is that talking about your inheritance or His inheritance? His. Really? Your inheritance is back in verse 11. In whom also we have obtained what? An inheritance. Being predestinated according to purpose of Him with work, which worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. We'll come back to that in a minute and I'll explain what that means. But in verse 11, you and I have a what? An inheritance. But in verse, in verse uh, 18, who has an inheritance? God the Father does. Look at the verse. The eyes of our understanding be enlightened that we might know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance. Now, now, where is His inheritance? Where is His inheritance? It's in the saints. God has an inheritance through you and I. He didn't just save you to give you an inheritance. He saved you to make a part of, make you part of something that He was doing through which He would what? Inherit something. What is that? Verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us toward who believe? According to working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ, when He raised Him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand where? Where? Far above. Verse 21. All principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this world, but also in that, excuse me, also in that which is to what? To come. And hath put all things under his feet. Who is the preeminent one according to Colossians chapter 1? All those things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, they were created by Christ and for who? Christ. He's going, to be, he's going to be the head of over all things on the basis of the blood of His cross. Is He going to reconcile all things unto Himself, whether they be in heaven or whether they be on earth? How's He going to do that? How, how is He going to reclaim the structures of governmental authority in the heavens? How's He going to accomplish that? He's going to accomplish that through the body of Christ. He's going to accomplish that through you and I. Verse 22, And it put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things. To who? To the church, which is His body. The fullness of Him that filleth all in all. You and I are the ones that He is going to use to fill up those positions of governmental authority. And by placing us in there, who is inheriting something for himself? See, you and I, we, see, <laughs> far more great things happened to you and I when we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ than just being saved from eternal punishment. 
You are lifted out of the prospect of eternal punishment and glorified all the way up to the heavens under the authority and headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who you are. That's who I am as a member of the body of Christ. We're not pond scum. We're not the scum of the earth. We are members of His body that He is using to inherit the heavenly places back to Himself. That's awesome. I think I should be saying amen. No. Go back to verse 10. Well, verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of His what? Will. See, has he, ma- see, has he made known unto you and I the mystery of His will? If He's made known unto you and I the mystery of His will, is there any part of His will that He hasn't made known? No. Having made known, un- having made known unto you and I the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure. Now watch. See? Which He purposed where? This made Him happy to do it this way! This is what brought joy and pleasure and happiness to the heart of God to work it out in this way so that in the end all of the maximum benefit and glory would be reserved to one person only and that's who? The Lord Jesus Christ. This is the way He wanted to do it. You understand that? And not only is it the way He wanted to do it, but He took you and made you a part of what He's doing. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to the good pleasure of Him that worketh, I'm sorry, which hath purposed all things, according to the good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself. What's the first word of verse 10? This is going to tell you the purpose and the intent of what He did and why He did it. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He might gather together in one, All things in who? Okay? Both which are where? Both which are where? In heaven and where? On earth, even in who? See, why did God do it this way? God did it this way so that out there in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He would gather together all things in heaven and earth and center all things in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it doesn't stop there. In whom? Verse 11. Who's that? In Christ. In whom also. So as though that weren't enough. Among whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Being predestinated to eternal life. Is that what it says? No. Being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. All things has a context, folks. Does that mean that every time you run over a nail or, you know, whatever thing, that that's all God working everything after the counsel of His own will? No, that verse has a context. Look at verse 11. In whom also you have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of who? Whose purpose is it? It's His purpose. And He's predestinated you to an inheritance according to His what? Purpose. Who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. What's the all things in that context? The all things in that context is answered in verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all what? All what? All things. In Christ, both which are where? The eternal plan and purpose of God, folks, is to center all things in the dispensation of the fullness of times under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you and I as members of the church, the body of Christ, we're a part of that. Well, I didn't get through anything I want to get done with here. Um, get in conclusion, get, get Ephesians 3 again and get Colossians 2. I hope you're getting what I'm saying to you this morning.
for me personally, the stuff we're talking about this morning, this stuff, this stuff can't leave you the way it found you. Okay? For you to have the privilege and the glory of understanding who you are. Not just that you're saved. Hey, is it great to know you're justified? Is it great to know you have eternal life and you're not going to have to suffer eternal punishment? Is that a great thing? That's awesome. But that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning of what God has purposed in Himself to do for you and I as a member of the body of Christ. And He gives you an inheritance and makes you part of His inheritance. That He is going to receive through you and I as members of the church, the body of Christ. That's why in Ephesians chapter 3, I'm just trying to decide which passage to go to first. So Ephesians 3 is first, so we'll go there. Go to Ephesians 3. Verse 8, Unto me whom less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Verse 9, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Do you understand that God wants you to know this stuff? God wants you to know who you are. God wants you to know how you fit into His plan. And it's His desire there in verse, in verse 8, I'm sorry, in verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. See, does God want all the church, the body of Christ, to understand the fellowship of the mystery? Do they? Do they? Unfortunately, what? No. Not yet. Is it our job to teach it? Is it our job to preach it? Is it our job to make known the fellowship of the mystery? Is it our job to proclaim the wisdom of God in the mystery? Verse 9, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created... There it is again. All what? All things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now... When's now? Right now to the intent that in the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of who? Do you understand what that verse means? That verse means that the angelic beings that occupy those principalities and powers in heavenly places right now, they learn about the manifold wisdom of God by watching us. You're teaching them. I'm teaching them. We're teaching them things that they could not have possibly known outside of them having been what? Revealed. That's what it, to the intent that now in the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of who? See, they learn about some wisdom that they didn't what? Know about. Because had they known about it, they wouldn't have what? Let's, let's go to Colossians 2. So I have a few questions. If it's God's will that all men see the fellowship of the mystery, you look across the religious landscape of Christendom right now, and you are coming face to face with the cold hard reality that the majority of the body of Christ knows nothing about it. Do they? Why would that be? Go to Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> Verse 14. I was watching the Michigan debacle yesterday. And it's interesting how as soon as the game's over, everyone wants to stick a microphone in the coach's face, right? Uh, what went wrong? We lost. <laughs> but what, what, what I'm after here is the following. You could take, you, you could, the coach could go stand up there at the podium at the, at the post-game press conference, right? And he gets hammered by the media. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? How come you did this, this, that, the other thing, you know? Why weren't you ready to play? Blah, blah, blah. You know the whole nine yards that they, that, 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 they, that they put you through, right? Do you think that the coach really wants to stand there? Why wouldn't he want to stand there? Because he's a loser. 
not individually, but as a, not personally, but as a coach, and he's got to sit there and answer for why he's a loser. Do you really like that very much? Is Satan a loser? He lost. On the basis of what did he lose? The fact that God kept the what? So it just makes sense, folks, that he would not want to have his name drugged through the mud by and large by a group of people called the body of Christ who are all speaking about, talking about, and making known the fellowship of the mystery, right? So what does he do? He tries to hide it under the cloak of religion. You can go to church, you can talk about Jesus, you can do this, you can do that, but just don't talk about the wisdom of God in the what? Mystery. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, he took it out of the way, nailing it to what? The cross. Now think about it, okay? How does God form the body of Christ? Through the blood of the cross. How does God in Colossians 1 reconcile all things to Himself in heaven and earth? On the blood of His what? His cross. Okay? So He forms the body of Christ on the basis of the blood of His cross. He reconciles the heavenly places and, and, and everything, really, back unto Himself by the blood of His cross. And if Satan and his guys had known about it, they never would have what? So is the revelation of the mystery, does it put Satan and his minions and principalities and powers in the heavenly places, does it put them to open shame? Every time you and I teach it, talk about it, discuss it, does it manifest something that they couldn't figure out that they said they knew? You with that? Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way. How was it taken out of the way? Nailing it to the cross, to his cross. Verse 15. And having spoiled. Spoiled there is a military term. Conquering army comes in and takes the spoils of war. Right? And then having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them what? Openly triumphing over them in it. What is the it? The cross. Why do so few members of the body of Christ know anything about the wisdom of God in a mystery? Because Satan has moved to obscure its truth. Because when it's preached, when it's talked about, when it's made known, it puts them to open shame. And it proclaims throughout the entire universe that he wasn't wiser than Daniel, that there was a secret that can be hid from him, and it demonstrates and manifests how the entire plan is going to end up coming to naught simply because God kept a what? Did, God, did Satan know, based on the prophetic scriptures, that the earth was in play? But he didn't bank on ever losing what? Because God never said anything what? And so here comes Paul, reveals the mystery, the cat's out of the bag, and Satan, <sighs> and so he responds. And the response that he has is to obscure it from view. To keep believers in the dark about what it is that God's doing and what God is trying to accomplish through them as members of the church, the body of Christ. And so believer after believer, generation after generation, has wallowed in the, and, 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 and been confused and not understood what God is doing when the truth was there the whole time if the Bible was rightly divided. And it, those of you that have been coming to the church history class, you know that we certainly are not the only ones. And that there is a line of saints throughout church history that understood aspects of these things, that understood the issues of justification by faith, that understood the issues of Pauline authority, that understood issues related to the fact that Paul is our, is our apostle, and that our doctrine for today as members of the body of Christ is found in his epistles. We've gone over that stuff in, in, in the Sunday school hour. 
I know I told you last, last verse for real. Go to go go to first first Corinthians no first Timothy chapter two. Lord Jesus Christ, the night before he was crucified, he stood there and he, he, he took he took the cup and the, the bread and he goes, This is the blood this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for what? For many. For the remission of what? Sins. How many is many? We had, we, we observed uh, we, we had Thanksgiving meal yesterday with uh, Becky's family and Man, I tell you what, they, I was starving, okay? Like, just starving, like gut hungry, right? And they bring out this bowl of cashews before the meal. And they're standing there, and I'm like, mmm. So I had some. Some. I didn't have all of them, because there was some left in the bowl when the time we got up to go eat, okay? Is there a difference between many and all? Yeah. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, who will have some men to be saved? Who will have only those who has predestinated to salvation? Is that what it says? No, it says who will have all men be what? Saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Is that God's will? Is that His will? Let's say it's His will. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. How's that verse end? To be testified when? In due time. In due time. Whereunto, verse 7, I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the, I speak the truth in Christ and I lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and what? See, the apostle of the Gentiles is the due time testifier of all that was accomplished where? At the cross. Were there aspects of the cross work that were hidden? Were there aspects of the cross work that were not made known? Were there aspects of everything that was being accomplished that day the Lord Jesus Christ hung on that cross that nobody knew about because they were a, they were a secret hidden God from before the foundation of the world? And who is the one that reveals the whole enchilada, as it were, since we're using food illustrations. Who's the one that reveals the whole, lets the whole cat out of the bag? It's Paul. And when he lets it out of the bag, you know who it puts to open shame? Satan. Because it demonstrates his inability to figure it out. And you and I are part of God's plan. He didn't just save you from your sins. He didn't just justify you and give you eternal life. He put you in the body of Christ and he included you in on what he's doing for himself. Dearly Father, thank you once again for your word and for the saints that are gathered here this morning. As we think about Thanksgiving, this is something to be thankful for. This is something to rejoice in. This is something to order your life around. This isn't empty, shallow, religious platitudes. This is reality of how you desired to work it out and include us in that plan. We pray that we would appreciate these things, that we would allow these things to, to, to sink down into our inner man, to the level of our hearts and our souls. And not just be things that we know intellectually, but they would become the wellspring out of which we live our lives. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.